so first of all, thank the organizer for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to give a talk here. Somehow the workshop has been amazingly on the topic until the last talk by Alex. Uh, I'm afraid my talk would join Alex for not actually mentioning any chaining method. Uh, I'm going to talk about validated learning with switching cost. So hopefully this is not completely irrelevant to the audience. Even though there's no chaining method in the talk, uh, the, the core idea to solve the problem, in the end, there is a multi-scale construction of some sort of random process. In some sense, it's kind of a multi-scale analysis. I kind of feel that chaining method is a special instance of multi-scale analysis. So in that way, maybe it is re remote and related. I uh, apologize for not, uh, there's no chaining in any case. So this is a joint work with uh, Arthur Deco, uh, Thomas Corrin, and Yuval Perez. The work occurred when I was a uh, visitor at Microsoft Research, I think in 2013, and Thomas Corrin was an intern back then. Uh, we did it at Microsoft at Redmond. Uh, okay, that's, so let's, let's go ahead. Very roughly speaking, this talk is about some sort of online learning, online games, where there is a player, in some sense it's also a learner, and the player has, in every round, has many actions, many possible actions to choose, you could also call it arms, experts, depending on your perspective. Uh, the player can choose one of these actions, and there is also an adversary, which in some sense is also an environment, would oppose a amount of losses to each of these actions. And naturally, if the player plays a certain action, the player would suffer the corresponding amount of loss uh, for that action. And naturally, the goal for the player would be to try to find out an algorithm that can minimize the accumulative loss over a large period of time in the, when playing the game. And the talk is about how well a player can do in, in, in a very rough sense. Uh, of course, okay, this is the kind of the ultimate picture that we want to arrive at. And already in this picture, there's a trailer about some regimes. You can, when I talk adversary, of course the adversary trying to mess things up, but it, it has a certain level of power. You could have some power or a, a, a lot of power. And the, 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 the player, there's some sort of information that the player can get. The player can get just the, the, the very little information to all the information uh, available to the, to the player. And depending on different regimes, there will be different uh, kind of uh, uh, how well that the, 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 the player can do in this game. Now let us be a little bit more formal. Uh, first of all, well, these days randomized algorithms are very popular. So let's allow that player to have player to have access to infinite amount of uh, randomness. So we allow randomized algorithms. If not, in the worst case study, the adversary can really mess things up easily. So that's one of the reasons also. And Let's consider two types of adversaries. These are the two extremes. The first one is an adaptive adversary, where the loss function can be depending on the past actions the player takes. So the adversary can really have a lot of flex flexibility in choosing the loss function the next step. The other type of adversary is a bit more friendly to our player. Well, basically he just sets up the uh, the sequence of loss functions up front, and then he left. The player just played the game on its own. This is referred to as oblivious adversary. And there are two types of, classically, two feedback models. One of them, the, the player only finds out the loss, the loss for the action he chose for the action he takes. If he didn't take the, some action, he, he's never going to find out the loss, uh, the loss value in that round. 
This is called the bandit feedback model. And the, another model, it's another extreme, which is the, called the full feedback model. No matter whether the player plays a, an action or not, the player always sees the, uh, the, the loss value in, in all the actions. Well, since this is an online game, of course, after time t, you can only see what happened after time t. You can't, there is no insight into the future, which I, I assume this is kind of a default assumption that everyone can accept. Okay. Well, there, these types of feedbacks both have natural examples, I think. For the full information, uh, full feedback model, you can imagine, for example, you invest in the stock market. Even though you didn't invest in a certain stock, tomorrow you can find out the price of the stock. So it's a full information model. The bandit feedback model is also very uh, plausible. For example, this is like if you didn't invest in something, if you didn't choose something, you would never find out the outcome. The, the examples include, for example, a, so you want to display a number of news articles in the website, and the loss function is whether you get a click or not in, from, from the users in the next time, time interval, time unit. Uh, you would never find out whether you would get a click for some article if you didn't dis display it, right? Uh, examples like that, there, there are many other things. For example, you treat, a, you treat a, a patient with medicines. If you didn't treat it with a certain medicine, you would never find out the effect for this patient. So, so these are both have uh, very plausible, very plausible practical background. A, okay. So now let's be even a bit more formal than two minutes ago, where we try to set up a mathematical framework for what we're talking about. Not no no more stories. So the setting is, we have a say a large time t round, a repeated game between a randomized player and a deterministic adaptive adversary. So we, the player has k actions. Well, the big, the, uh, it's the space x. OK. k, even though for most of the results, k can be arbitrary, for the, reason of the, uh, for the purpose of enjoying this talk, you can just imagine that k is equal to 2. So the difficulties are the same. So. You can think k is 2. And before the game, the adversary would choose a sequence of loss functions, f1 dot dot ft, and each function maps the, the x to the power of t is just all the actions that has been chosen up to time t maps this kind of uh, input to some loss function, sorry, to some loss value between 0 and 1. In, in, re in reality, the, you, you, would, you would imagine that the loss values should be bounded. That's a very reasonable assumption. And actually, that would be crucial later at some point. And the game would be, well, for each time t, the, uh, sequentially, the player choose a certain distribution mu t. Uh, that's the distribution that he would play a certain, a certain action. And then this player would suffer and observe the loss uh, that, that is specified by, by the adversary before the game for that particular action he plays in that round. Yes? I will answer your question in, in, in half a minute. If it's full f feedback, then the player would observe also the, the value of the function for other, for other actions. To your question, if it's adaptive, the function ft can be arbitrary. It can really map any x, of x to the t to, to, some, to, the, to the interval between 0 and 1. But if the adversary is ob oblivious, then the, uh, these functions are, are more limited. It has to be a function based on just on the current, current action. The previous t actions. The previous t actions taken by the player is a vector, right? Oh, okay. And if the if the uh, 
adversary is adaptive, the, this value, this function can actually depend on all these actions. If it's obvi oblivious, then the function can just be some sort of L of t maps the current action uh, to, 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 to some loss value. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Good. Okay. Well, we have a game, we have a mathematical framework, now we need to find a measure to, to decide how well one, uh, some sort of algorithms can do uh, for these games. A, well, a natural measure is the expected cumulative loss for the player, since you use randomized algorithms. You just sum up all the loss, loss values uh, throughout the game. And since this loss function has some sort of arbitrary, you, we need to compare the uh, expected cumulative loss to some benchmark. And in this kind of games, we are actually very modest. We didn't try to shoot for the opt optimal actions you can take. Optimus, you choose action one, choose action two, choose action one, so that you can minimize the, uh, the loss function. That's a bit too much to ask for, because there's no structure a priori. We are looking at the worst case study. A priori, there's no structure in the sequence of loss functions. So comparing to the optimal value is kind of unrealistic. The benchmark we are taking is the, is the best action, is the best, best fixed action. Suppose you just stick to a certain action and you stick to the optimal one, how well you can do. And the difference between the expected cumulative loss of a certain randomized algorithm and this, uh, optimal value if you stick to one of the actions is called regret. And the goal is to uh, minimize the regret. If the regret is little of t, the interpretation is that the player gets smarter with time. Otherwise, well, basically, you, you can say that the, 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 the game is unlearnable. So the last, I think this is the last uh, terminology for a while. The kind of regret we are measuring is a minimax type of regret. It's kind of natural, meaning we consider the minimum of overall randomized player strategies and then of the supremum of the adversary loss sequences that is of the resulting expected regret. Uh, so it's kind of a, you want to find the best algorithm that works for the, for the worst scenario, basically. An easy uh, observation is that, well, no matter what is the, no matter whether it's the bandit feedback or full information feedback, your regret cannot be smaller than square root t. One way to see this is, well, you can just choose Every time, you know, say k is equal to two, every time the loss function is uh, a random permutation of zero and one, independently. So since every round are independent of each other, there is nothing you can learn. It's like every time you choose something, it's like you just uh, choose a random, uh, choose an independent random sampling. And this would have some sort of expectation. But since you have two, Random sequences of length t, the sum, the minimum of the, the, the minimum of the, sorry, the, the sequence that has the smallest sum will be, will get, give you a square root t, that kind of uh, uh, gap from what it should be. And you can't beat this because there's nothing you can learn from uh, if, if, you, if, the, uh, if the environment is like that. So if, Indeed, you can achieve this square root t bound. We say the problem is easy. That's kind of the best you can hope for. If, if the regret can, can be only of order t, then the, we say the problem is unknowable. Now let's look at the few combination of the regimes. First of all, if there's, first let's look at the most friendly regime where you get full feedback and the adversary is just oblivious. Uh, for this model, Little Stone and Warmoth in 94, and Freon and Shapara in 97, uh, found that 
one can just use the multiplicative weights algorithm to achieve the score root t regret. Let me also give a remark that the multipl multiplicative weights algorithm is very popular and very powerful. Uh, the application to the online learning algorithms here is just one instance. It can be applied to many other things. And it has been discovered and rediscovered for many times uh, in, in the literature. Sorry, LJ? LJ is the loss function. The LJI is the loss value for the, I don't know whether J is the time or I is the, one, one of them, J is the time and I is the action. So basically the algorithm goes like the following. You just want to choose a action to play randomly at, at time t. You the, in order to do that, you take the accumulative sum of all the loss functions for each action and assign the probability proportional to the exponential of the negative of these sums. Well, you can, you can, uh, you can sneak in a parameter gamma there to, to, tune the, to tune the algorithm, which is very natural, right? Because if some action hasn't been doing so well so far, you penalize on that. And it turns out, if you choose gamma to be one of the root t, it gives you the optimal regret. And the analysis is not very hard. It's like maybe a page kind of proof for that. So this is the situation where you have full information and the, and the adversary is oblivious. Now let's look at the bandit situation. This is a bit more surprising. Uh, Aura, Cersei, Bin, Bianchi, Friand, and Shapir in 2002 improved or, or modified the multiplicative weights algorithm uh, into the context of bandit feedback. Let's think for a minute. What is missing if you want to use the sort of multiplicative weights algorithm? You don't know what is the accumulative loss for, certain, uh, for a certain action, right? Because you only see the loss values for the actions you have played at each round. And for those you don't, it's a missing value. So in order to somehow mimic what has been done in the multiplicative weight algorithm, you will have to predict or estimate those missing values somehow. And what is a bit mysterious that is that this can be done and in some sort of not even so complicated way. Basically, you have for each action, you have some probability to take it. If you didn't take it, you, you didn't see anything. So let's put a zero there. If you take it, you, you see the value, but then you use the value to divide by the probability you take it. This gives you an unbiased estimate for the, for the loss value there. And, and you just replace this prediction for the loss value in the, in the multiplicative weights algorithm, and, and it just works. This analysis is a bit more complicated, and it's a bit, to me, it's a little bit surprising that it just works. And this also gives you a score root t uh, regret Sorry, in this scenario. Yes. That's right. But but you, but after a long time t, you would imagine that for each for each action you have been you have been playing for some number of times, so. I don't know. It's random, right? This, this, bias, this unbiased estimate give you an es uh, determines the probability you play each action, and the probability you play each action would, depend, would, would determine what you're going to see in the next round with what the probability and would, would affect your estimate in the next round. But in any case, this is the unbiased estimate, meaning the expectation of this is the true value. Does it make sense? Okay. So this also gives you a root t regret. Now let's look at a more malicious adversary, which is adaptive. This one is actually, I mean, 
easy to solve, but it's hard to learn, but this is, it's easy to see, it's hard to learn. And this is observed in the paper of Arara, Deco, and Tavari in 2012. Basin says if the, uh, if the adversary can be adaptive, it's just unlearnable in, feed, in any feedback model. Because you can just say, well, suppose you have taken action one, then all the loss values will be one, otherwise it's just zero. Then, then, then there's not much you can do about it. This is not a very hard result. So now we actually arrive at a complete characterization. If it's an oblivious adversary, no matter whether it's a bandit or fool, we can always achieve a sugar root T uh, regret. If it's adaptive, then it's of order T. Nothing left if this is the case. But if we think for a bit more, when we look at the ad uh, adversary between adaptive and oblivious, there's still room for inter interpolation. And some of them are actually quite natural. And that's, that's the thing that I'm going to focus, focus on in the rest of the talk. I want to introduce a switching cost uh, to, the, to, to the game. Basically, let's imagine that the Adversary still sets, sets up the, uh, the loss function up front and just left. But when you play the game, whenever you change your action, whenever you, play, you change your action from, from one arm to another, to another arm, you suffer a loss of, say, a unit loss or a loss of a half. Then, well, this can be actually seen as interpolation between oblivious and adaptive because essentially now the, uh, this is a special instance when the loss function is a function of the previous two, of the current and the previous uh, actions. Let me spend a minute to convince you that this is actually not artificial model, it's a very, actually a very natural, natural trick of the model. Um, Imagine that, well, you have two options of, uh, say, collaboration companies for something. And it, so if you want to switch from one company to the other one, that usually would involve terminating one contract and starting a new one. There would be usually initial fee. Those are the switching costs. Or if you, you're in a manufacturing company, you want to uh, change your production plans, then you probably have to reconfigure the production line or something like that. So whenever you want to switch your strategy, in reality, it does incur some sort of cost. I think that's kind of plausible, at least. Besides being plausible in practice, it actually has, well, it leads to some interest in mathematics I'm going to describe to you soon. With switching cost, what can we do? Well, there are still the different type of feedback models, right? If the feedback model is full of information, then you can still get root T regret. There are two types of algorithms, which essentially are, of, they are different, but they are of the sa similar flavor. Since you are now we, there is a penalty for each switching, then you want to kind of design some sort of optimal algorithm, but try to decrease the amount of switchings you would have otherwise, right? And one of such algorithms is a follow the lazy leader algorithm. Uh, this is by Kalai and Vampala. Basically, you just, well, a naive thing to do is just follow the current leader. Who is doing the best so far, you just follow it. But that's not going to work. You add a little bit of perturbation to it, a random perturbation, and you follow the, you follow the leader with, with the perturbation. And that algorithm just works. Leader is the, is, the, is the current action which the current cumulative loss is the smallest. I mean, you have different options. For each of them, you can calculate. Since it's full information, you can calculate the, the, the cumulative loss, choose the minimal one, that's the leader. You don't, following that one, it's not going to work. You put it a little bit, you get a good algorithm. Excellent. 
uh, the talk I was emphasizing the case where the switching cost is also unit, but the, you, you, can, you can take care of the arbitrary switching cost. Okay, I guess, I guess what we have written down is about, or thought of, is the constant switching cost. If your switching cost is not a constant function, things may, may be a bit more complicated, but I haven't thought about that. But any constant switching cost is it, okay. There's also the algorithm of shrinking the data body, which is that dark board, which is of the similar flavor, so I'm not going to describe it in details. Okay. Here's another type of feedback model, which in the end reduces to uh, the, the, bond, the bonded model with the switching cost. So, well, let's just skip it. Now we arrive at this kind of pictures. We have this kind of adversaries and this kind of uh, feedbacks, though I kind of simplified it for you by skipping one slide. The characterization so far is, as shown in the figure, if it's adaptive, nothing you can do. Let's, for now, let's just ignore this column. Let's, focus on the column with switching. With switching cost, if it's full information, then the regret you can achieve is routine, that's, that's, and that's optimal. Without, uh, sorry, in the, if it's switching and with bandit feedback, well, of course, the routine low bound still holds, just because, by, by, by the example I gave at the very beginning. And can you, what can you achieve by, by some algorithms? There is a work of Arara, Deco, and Tavari, which give you a very simple algorithm that achieves t to the two-thirds upper bound. I will describe the algorithm in a moment. So up to now, the, the issue is, which one is the truth? Is square root t or t to the two-thirds or something in between? And the contribution of our work is to address this question by saying that t to the two-thirds is the truth. And actually, before our work, Sesha Benacci, Dako, Shamir uh, constructed the, some sort of instance which with unbounded loss, where the, 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 the regret has a lower bound of t to the two-thirds. The, the paper that I'm talking about uh, removes the kind of not so natural condition of the unbounded loss, losses. So that's the result. Now, uh, this, is the, this is the algorithm I promised half a minute ago, which achieves two to the two thirds. It's not at all hard. It's the simplest thing you can imagine. Since you there is a penalty for each switching. You just want to minimize the switching. How to do that? Well, you, 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 can, you can say you only switch after a certain amount of actions, after a certain, certain amount of runs, right? So you just block the, uh, all the, 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 the runs into sides of B, so you get a T over B blocks. Now for each block, you can just treat the feedback in the block you treat the average of the loss function as the feedback you receive at, for, for that block. And you apply the, say, the EXP3 algorithms uh, to the bounded information, to, 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 the, uh, to the bounded model. And the regret you would get is, since there are at most T over B that many blocks, that's an upper bound for the number of switchings. And now you want to analyze the uh, the, regret, the, 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 the regret you get by applying the ESP3 algorithm, you have t over b runs, so you get square root of t over b, but now each round, the amount of loss can be larger than one, but it can be at most b, so you, you get b times that. You optimize over it, and you, you realize that if you choose b equal to two, t to the one third, that's the optimal choice, and you get t to the two thirds regret. It's simple, well, at least, up, at least after someone presented it to me, it's simple. I don't know whether I can find it myself easily. That's my, when I say it is simple. 
you get, you get the t to the two-thirds upper bound. Now, the real game that left, that, that remains, is the lower bound. In order for this, we are going to use the Yao's min-max min principle back to 75. It states that, okay, it's a little bit uh, confusing, but it states that the expected regret of the best algorithm on the random sequence gives the lower bound on the kind of min-max regret you want to. So in order, for, in order to get a lower bound, that means we just need to construct some sort of a hard random sequence and claim that and prove that for any deterministic algorithm, a, the, the regret is large, then we are done. By the way, when I say lower bound, upper bound, this is all information theoretical bounds. There's no, we don't care about computation complexity. You have all the computation power in the world you, you wish. Uh, this, this, this principle is, okay, the direction we wanted here is an easy direction of this kind of duality principle. And the proof is just by basically exchange order of summations and applying pigeonholes principles. So, so don't be scared, this is, this is simple. So in light of this minimax principle, the goal is just now to find a hard random loss sequence and show that any deterministic algorithm would not work. Would have to have a large regret. Again, we assume that t, uh, k is equal to two, as we have done already for quite a while. So I already mentioned that previous to the current work I'm discussing, uh, Cesar Bianchi, Daiko, and Shamir already constructed random sequences, uh, the, the loss functions that is unbounded, where the uh, lower bound has, where the regret has to be lower bounded by t to the two thirds. Let's, let's look a bit more carefully of their construction because it's actually educating what they're doing. Okay, before I look at it, let's think about it. Now with the switching cost, we want to construct a random sequence, random instances that is hard. How can we do that? Well, since we are comparing your regret against the minimum of the losses for among two actions. Naturally, you want the two actions have some difference, right? If they're the same, well, that's bad. So we want one action to be a bit better than the other guy. And suppose I can hide this information to you for a large time. For a large time, if you don't switch often, then I win the game, right? Either you, you, you will, it would incur a loss if either you switch or you choose the unfavorable, unfavorable uh, action. So if you, without many switches, you can't identify which action is unfavorable, then you will lose the game. So that would be the goal. The goal is to try to hide uh, which, which action is, is favorable and which one is not. So in light of this discussion, now what they're doing is kind of uh, very natural. Okay, maybe one, one natural attempt is your first sample IID loss functions and then systematically, I mean, you choose one action, specify that as the unfavorable one, then you add some sort of epsilon loss to each, in each round in that action, right? But this is bad because if all the samplings, if all the samples are IID, in order to, in order to, a, if, if all the samplings are ID, then you can actually get some information even if you don't switch, right? Because you just wait until, say, say the bias is epsilon. You wait until one of epsilon square number of rounds, you can, you can identify whether you are in the good, a good action or bad action, and then you can proceed cautiously. The way to hide this information to you if you don't switch, it's, by, it's, it's to replace this ID construction with, with the random walks. Say you're sampling Gaussian random walk, this is, this is going to be the backbone of the two actions. And then the other one would just be a shift of it by, by amount of epsilon, systematically. And of course, I randomize over these two, 
to action. So you can't tell a priori which one is bad, which one is good. If you think for a minute, the advantage of this construction is, well, of course, the first, if you play the first action, you observe something. This would give you some information about whether you are in the good, good action or bad action, right? But it's a lot of noise, because the difference is epsilon, epsilon is presumably small. And the noise of variance one, say. So by the first, you observe something, but it's not enough to tell which one, whether you are in the good, uh, good action or bad, bad action. And if you stay in the same action, you get no information. Because, because, because the construction is a random walk. In order to get any information, any, in order to get any additional information, you would have to switch. And every time you switch, the information you get is like another noise sampling. Another, another noise sampling of variance one and containing information epsilon. So in order to eventually de determine with good probability which one is a good action, you will have to switch for the number of times which is of order one of epsilon square. So the lower bound is either you have switched this many times, or if you don't, then you will suffer, has, with a good chance you will suffer epsilon for each round, and the game has t rounds, right? Sorry, it's not plus, it's minimum. It's either, either of the two, you will have to suffer the loss. Now you just choose epsilon judiciously, you get t to the two thirds lower bound. The disadvantage of this proof is that the loss function is unbounded, which is kind of unnatural. Also, theoretically, it's not clear whether this truly suggests that t to the two thirds is the, lower is, the, is the real lower bound, or this t to the two thirds is an artifact. It's a consequence of the artifact of the unbounded loss function. And actually, the authors who wrote this paper, it's not clear about that either. Well, I know this because there's a non-empty non overlap of the authors for these two papers. So that's the, that's the construction if you allow the uh, loss functions to be unbounded. Now the issue is to, well, how can we address this? How can we construct a hard random process where it's very hard for you to detect any information without switching, but, but the, 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 the process will not be of of order root t will be of order, hopefully, roughly of order one. Another, the, 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 the sort of natural attempt of ID doesn't, doesn't work because the, you just can't hide the information. And what we learned from this construction is in order to hide the information, you still want some sort of random walk uh, construction. How can we think of random walk in a broader context? Because if we think random walk in a broader context, then we can try to find something that is in between these two things, right? Well, this is the so-called multi-scale random walk, but for those more in the probability world, this is just a, a version of branching random walk. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to use the language of multi-scale random walk because of the connection of multi-scale to chaining method. The idea is still to first sample ID increments. But now at any time t, in order to assign the, the value at time t, I find the, I find the parent of, of t, which is rho t. Then I use, I sum the value of the parent and the, the increment you just sampled, which, we, which will give you the current value at t. If I view random work in this way, then there is a huge family of random works, which is governed by this kind of parent function rho, right? If I choose rho always to be rho t to be t minus one, that's the random walk. If I choose rho to be zero, that's ID samplings. But there are other, other choices of rho. Uh, what kind of choices of rho is good? Well, we have to remember our two objectives, right? We want to keep the, the values to be small, and also we want to hide the information. In order to keep the values to be small, that means, well, that's kind of, okay, if you like, this is the, Gaussian, the width of the Gaussian process. But what really matters is the maximum, uh, is the maximum variance of the, 
uh, of this multi-scale random walk. If you, if you have add too many random variables together, then, well, the value will be large. If you are only adding a small number of random variables together all the time, then you don't lose much. But also we want to hide the information. Okay, in this picture, these are the pictures for the examples. Uh, rho t equal to zero, these are simple pictures. You, all the parents are just, a, just L zero. When rho t equal to t plus minus one, all the parents are the previous guy. And this is another example, which is the example we used. It may not look so nice when you see the formulation t minus GCD of d and the two to the two to the t. Okay, yeah, that's fine. GCD. Uh, it, may, it may be a bit hard to process this formulation, but this is just a binary tree essentially. And We have seen what is the trouble for these two constructions. When it is random walk, the, the random walk here is too deep, meaning, well, you have a very long path. Actually, the, the, the path is of order t, so you're going to get root t, that kind of magnitude for your loss function. In the ID case, it's very wide. Here, wide meaning, well, let's take a vertical cut we can take the maximum vertical cut. Actually here, yeah, we, we, let's take the maximum vertical cut, meaning we cut here and see how many edges it overlaps, it cuts through. It, it is of order t. That means one switch already gave you t samplings. That's also bad. So we want to balance both of this, minimizing the depth and the width simultaneously. And in the end, the construction is just given by that. You imagine that you have a binary tree. Since the t is corresponding to the size of the leaves, right? So the height or the depth of the tree is log of t. And the width of the tree, this you have to think for a bit, or, or, you, or you have to trust me in this, by this picture. If you draw these things for the, for the tree, it would also be of order log of t. So by using this sort of multi-scale construction, I simultaneously push down uh, the, the depth and the width of the random process, of, of this multi-scale random walk. I will lose polylog terms, but let's say we don't care about it. Now this is a illustration of the, of the loss functions using the sort of the ideas I was discussing uh, in previous slides. You have one, you have two actions, one of them is more favorable, and the difference between them is always epsilon, um, and the backbone construction is the multi-scale random walk. Okay. Now, once the example is given, the analysis it's not actually very hard. Let me give, well, basically I was kind of, I will, I'm going to repeat and reformulate the observations we had in, we discussed in the last five minutes. Um, well, this is a fact that has been basically asked by Odad yesterday in a sort of different form. We want to estimate the mean of Gaussians with the accuracy epsilon, how many samples you need. We need one of, a, Okay, let's say the variance is one. We need one of epsilon squared, that kind of order. Right? Now you, you, you should ask yourself, each switch, how many samplings, how many effective samplings you get by each switch in this, in this game? Well, you see that in, if you stay, suppose this is the action you take. If you stay in the same action, uh, in time two and time three, we see there's no additional information. And here, 
we, we, at time six, since it's different from time four and there is an arc connecting them, you get one effective sample. Uh, you have to convince yourself a bit, but it's not, it's not very hard to see if you just, but this probably requires sitting down and with the five minutes patience of calculation and, or, 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 or drawing some pictures. You can convince yourself that the total number of samplings, effective samplings you'll get, it's smaller by the number of switches multiplied, multiplied with the maximum, maximum width of, the, of this construction. And since the maximum width of the construction, or, or simply the width of the construction, is bounded by log of t, so the number of samplings you get is bounded by the number of switches times log of t. And this is the key lemma here. After this, what remains is some technical computation you would have to do, which you would you'd say, for example, pin skins in inequality to relate relative entropy to total variation distance. It takes some work, but not much. And it can be, it, and the, the, the sort of tools you use and the methods, you are, the, the calculations you are doing are sort of standard. It, it's just a graduate exercise at this point. I'm not gonna do it, but it's not hard. Okay, so if we put all of these things together, basically either you suffer by not, by, by, by going through a lot of switches, or you suffer by not being able to tell which one is the uh, better action. We get, if you're optimizing over the epsilon, you get the, uh, the lower bound of t to the two thirds over log t or log, log square of t, I can't remember. Uh, well, there are some actually consequences. Let me just mention one of them. In the, without switching, we know that the EXP3 algorithm give you a root T regret, even if it's bounded, right? But now, combining with our lower bound, we can see that in some of the really nasty scenarios, the EXP3 algorithm, algorithm or any algorithm that achieves is root, root t lower bound. We have to do a lot of switchings. I mean, there are scenarios like that. So that, that may be of some interest to, to some people. Okay. Uh, finally, this is a summary. We arrive at a complete characterization of the learning hardness. This is the information theoretical learning hardness of, the, uh, of this kind of games. Mm. The, if we add switching cost to the game, there is a difference in the hardness, in the learning hardness between full information and abundant inf information, which is not observable if you are doing a full information model. Well, eventually we arrive at this picture, it seems, which seems to be complete. Uh, that's the end of my talk.